Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it is the second mail call video for the channel. On this video, I will show the stuff that people have sent into my PO box. I'll open it up for you guys to all see. And then eventually I'm gonna to get to videos for each of these products. It's gonna take me a little bit of time, but I'll get to that stuff eventually. I have a lot of projects piled up. Anyhow, anyhow, let's get right to it. Okay, the first package is from Tom in Maricopa, Arizona. That's here in the United States. Not too far from Oregon. I mean, it's not close either, <laughs> but it's, you know, not on the East Coast, I guess is what I'm saying. All right, so the first thing says hearsay 1000. I apologize, Tom, if you talk to me in, on email, because I don't really recall what this might be, but let's take a look. It's very, very, very nicely packaged. Oh, yes, no, I remember now. I'm pretty sure this is some kind of speech synthesis module for the Commodore 64. The Hearsay 1000. What is this? What is this thing in the corner here? It's very strange. Edge connector, luckily gold plated. It's a bit scratched up, but that might work. And then this cable, this probably plugs into the video output connector on the C64. And this little thin wire here is the audio input back into the C64. So that if you have a RF modulator and you're using a TV set with the RF modulator, you will hear the sound of this thing, which when it produces speech. Tom said he wasn't aware of whether this works or not, so it'll be interesting to test this out. I did a little Googling and I found the box cover for the Hearsay 1000. Fascinating, it says a two-way voice interaction system lets your computer talk, listen, teach, and obey. Hmm... It was hard to find information for this, but I managed to also find a scan of the instruction manual for it. There's a copyright notice in the beginning of the manual, so 1986, a little bit later than the 82 release date of the 64. So let's get to the meat of this manual. Here it says the Hearsay 1000 is both a voice synthesizer and a voice recognition system. Now you can talk to your computer and have it respond to you. And then as I thought, that DIN connector goes into the video port on the Commodore 64, which will feed the audio into the machine. This section of the manual talks about the demo disc. I did manage to find a D64 image that should be the disc that came with this package. So hopefully there's the right software on there. The section talks about the different features on the floppy disk and here's a demonstration of Aqua Circus, a two-way voice interactive program that teaches children color shapes and numbers. That's cute sounding. Look at this, option four is a short demo of the intelligent talking terminal. It's an advanced telecommunications package that will allow you to communicate with other computers or database networks over telephone lines. Say either CompuServe or MCI Mail. Oh, this is probably gonna be terrible. I gotta give them props for trying to think futuristic here, but I'm sure in practice this stuff works terribly. It looks like option five is something that works with most other manufacturers software like the game Zork. You can train it with words and then you can use the demonstration. Okay, so I guess you can say open and then mailbox and in Zork it opens the mailbox. <laughs> That's pretty cute. That's fanciness. Anyhow, in a future video, I'll get to trying the Hearsay 1000 out. And then the other thing he sent, it says VCM 64, which if I recall what he told me is also some kind of a voice or speech module for the 64. Plugs into the user port connection with this PCB here. And then the box says Chirpy. Oh, voice command module. VCM by ENG, VCM 64. Maybe there were certain games that support this. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of research. So I did a little Googling and I found some pictures from the voice command module, at least for the box. VCM64 for the Commodore 64, software included. But what's strange is up at the top, 
that's definitely an Apple II Plus with an Apple monitor. Did they make this for the Apple II as well? This appears to be the back of the box. The no hands voice command system. It's as easy as talking to you to maintain and expand your computer's usefulness at school, home, and at work. Looking at these list of features here, it seems like this particular product is only for voice input and has no output capability. It does say you need three to five minutes of training and response time is less than one second. Hey, that's not bad. This appears to be an advertisement for the voice command module. As you speak in the microphone, the machine captures a sample of your voice, compares it to stored pre-recorded samples, and decides if it matches. Stores up to 64 different words for later recall. <laughs> Includes SOS, Speech Operating System. Ha, ah, that'll be fun to check out. Here's a funny little screenshot. The Aeronaut game included with the voice command module requires you to direct the hot air balloon by voice rather than keyboard. That is, you use your own hot air to manipulate the balloon's hot air. And finally, I have a picture here showing the complete package. It appears there's three floppy disks with this. I was only able to find one single D64, and I was not able to find the original manual. So if you know of any source for the copy of the manual and or a copy of the software, I would really appreciate it because it will help me with testing this thing. All right, next up is a package that has no name on it, so I'm not sure who this is from. Let's open this up, it's quite squishy. This is so awesome. This came from Matt, he chatted with me on email and said he was gonna send this over to me. When I made that video about that $10 handheld from China, these are kinda of one step up, or maybe about 500 steps up from that. And what this is, it's a reproduction Game Boy case and you put a Raspberry Pi Zero in here, or maybe it supports a few different Raspberry Pis. It says on the box here, Pi Zero and Pi Zero W. Yeah, so you need a Pi Zero, but check it out. Now this, this feels like a quality piece of hardware. The button, I mean, okay, there's no comparison between this and the quality of the $10 device. The GPI case has been out for a little while. I think it's made by Retro Flag and it's extremely well made. I had an original Game Boy that this thing is modeled after and the Game Boy felt really good in hand, typical Nintendo of that time. And this feels just as nice to use. The Raspberry Pi Zero actually goes into this little cartridge slot that goes on the back of the unit. It is a 2.8 inch IPS screen, so none of the quality issues of the $10 handheld. And from a feel perspective, I mean, you see that has the ribs on the back, just like the original Game Boy. Even this cartridge section has the similar shape to the original Game Boy cartridge. It runs on standard AA batteries as well, which is just awesome. Here's a little animation of how slick the Pogo pin adapter is. It goes between the G Pi case itself and plugs into the Raspberry Pi Zero without any solder required. I did open up the cartridge thing on the one I got and it had the Raspberry Pi Zero installed and I was just gobsmacked by how awesome this design was. It must have taken quite a lot of work for them to get this perfected. As I mentioned before, it works with either the Pi Zero or Pi Zero W, the W being the one with wireless support built in. And in case you're curious, the weight or the mass is 183 grams for this device. I clicked through to the buy link. So this is the Retro Flag store on Amazon and $70 US with prime shipping. It's clearly a lot more expensive when you combine this with the price of the Raspberry Pi Zero, which I think is usually 15 or $10. But if you think about what you're getting here, you're getting a much higher quality device along with emulation that can run any emulation that the Pi Zero can support. So NES, Game Boy, probably the C64, Atari 2600, all sorts of old retro consoles, and you can play them all in something that has the form factor of the original Game Boy. So a huge thank you to Matt for saying this over to me. I will get around to reviewing this and comparing it head to head with the $10 console from China. All right, next up is a rather large package. This one's from Dave in Macclesfield, England. It's just outside of Manchester, if I am correct. Dave had hit me up on email and we chatted about what this is, so it's not a surprise. Slide this out. All sorts of things in here. All right, check it out. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. 
two tape cassettes for the Commodore 64 and 128. And we have CJ's Elephant Antics, also for the C64. And then we have Kamikaze from Codemasters. Oh, this was also Codemasters. And here we have Gauntlet, also for the C64 from Atari Games, US Gold. Has a few different screenshots in the back for the Amstrad, C64, and the Spectrum. And it looks like there's a letter from Dave. He said he picked out a selection of software, but don't be disappointed by the lack of a gauntlet disc. Couldn't find it. The package was so sturdy, I've used it to send you others. Ah, look at this. We had a 10 gun game. Atari, this is Atari's computer game division. They released a lot of clone NES cartridges, ones that were unlicensed, caused a big lawsuit. But this is Escape from something, uh, Robot Monsters, Commodore 64 disc, and also Clax, also Tengen. We got Creatures, a Thalamus release from 64. And there's one more tape here. Gauntlet 2 Kicks. Oh yes, this is awesome. 64 and 128 version. But wait, there's more. There's some more hiding under this. So awesome, we got an Ocean Pack with six games. The Six Shooter C64 Game Pack from Dixon's, which is a store in the UK. I guess they sold a lot of cassette games back in the day. This is really, really neat. And we have one more big pack here. It's great, good packing, Dave. Oh, we got Bionic Commando, really nice. This is the C64 port, the original cassette version. Even though it's a big box, there's only actually one tape. Oh, Bionic Commandos, plural. Isn't it Bionic Commando, singular? Even on the back of the box here, it says Bionic Commando. So what's the deal with Commandos? Plural. I played this game on the 64, but it's it's nice to have a really cool cassette version of it. Okay, then we have this package here. Let's take a look at what this is. Dave packed this really well. Sorry, I had a piece of foam stuck to my chest. This is like unwrapping an oyster. Oh, yes. Dave has sent me his original Commodore 64 board. Now you're probably asking yourself, another Commodore 64 board? Don't I already have enough of these? And, and I do have quite a few of these actually. But what I don't have are any PAL Commodore 64s and that's what this is. So the story behind this stuff is that after watching one of my C64 repair videos, Dave went and found his original 64 from when he was a kid up in his loft or in the basement somewhere of his house and he decided to plug it in. He said that it didn't work though. And with Dave being a software developer, he didn't feel like he had the ability to fix this thing if there were a problem with it. So he offered it up to me. He wanted to send the entire Commodore 64 to me, but I told him that I, there's really no need for that because the case and everything else is gonna be exactly the same as all the 64s I have. But what I don't have is a PAL motherboard like this. So I asked him if he could just send the motherboard. And then he found a bunch of his old games and I asked him to include some of his favorite ones I bet you people watching this video from the UK are going to have tons of memories or going into shops like Dixon's and getting a pack of games like this and coming home and being super excited to play them to then have to put them in your tape drive and wait for, you know, 20 minutes for the game to load. Anyway, I'm hoping to get this board fixed up so I can have an actual PAL Commodore 64 and then it'll be really fun to try out some of these games. Let's take a quick look at this Commodore 64 board. It's pretty darn dirty. I'd be curious to see what condition Dave's entire 64 was in. Judging by the filth on this board, the outside of the computer must have been really, really dirty. I'm really curious to know if this board even works and it might just work as is. It could have been his power supply that was just faulty. He doesn't have any others to test with. So let's just do a really quick diagnosis and see if this thing works right off the bat. Something Dave said to me over email was really funny. He told me that there was no RF shield on this board and he didn't know what happened to it. And I informed him that I'm almost certain that this 64 probably never had an RF shield. And that's because at the time of this release, RF shields probably just weren't necessary in the UK. That was a US thing due to FCC regulations. Also, just taking a quick look at the board, there is no evidence of any rework whatsoever. So this board probably worked from the day he got it and never had needed any repairs whatsoever. Taking a quick look at the date codes on these chips here, we have the 31st week of 83. Actually, this CIA chip is 40th week of 84. So everything else on this board is later 1983. So I'm gonna go and say that this computer is probably from late 83 and it did have a little repair done. 
Dave, if you're watching, let me know if that's the case. So I'm editing the video and I'm gonna break in with a little information about this machine. I asked Dave about the history of this 64 and to see what he could remember. And while this 64 looks like it was made in 1983, but it had one chip that was repaired from 94, from what he remembers, he got this machine secondhand or used from Tim's Megastore, which was a store that was near his house and opened in 1985. Dave remembers that this store was one of the only ones around that you could buy secondhand or used electronics from. So he thinks that the owner, Tim, probably bought this computer with a fault, repaired it himself, and then sold it off as secondhand. Dave thinks he got the computer around 1986 or 87, and we can theorize that Tim himself, the owner of the store, probably replaced that faulty 6526 CIA chip with a replacement Commodore part to make this computer work again. Dave does note that it was only in 2016 that this store closed. I'll put this link in the description if you want to read the article about it yourself. So I'm just going to start by lifting the chips out of the sockets, and I want to test to see if the power rails are good on this thing. And I'm going to take out things like the SID and the PLA in case there's a problem with the power regulation over here. I don't want to potentially damage any of these original chips. So on the 12 volt, I'm getting 12.0, which is perfect. On the regulated five volt rail, I am getting 4.965, which is perfect as well. But on the TTL logic chips, I'm getting nothing, no voltage whatsoever. That would really imply two problems. Either the power connector is bad or the power switch is bad. The fuse right here on the board, this is what handles the AC input, the nine volts AC. That's what get turns into the 12 volts and the five volts right here. So the fuse is good, the rectifier is good, and these regulators are good, but we lack five volts to run most of the logic chips. And Dave indicated he got no power LED and that would be because there's no five volt rail going to almost everything on here. I'm gonna quickly check across these bypass caps for a short circuit on the five volt rail. And no, we're not getting a short circuit. So I don't think there's a short on here. I think it really is something wrong with the power switch up here. So I'm testing continuity on the power switch. So the bottom pins are working fine. We get, turn it on, you know, you get immediate continuity, but the top pins aren't working so well. See, that's not because of my multimeter probes. That's the switch itself. And I sprayed a bunch of deoxid into the switch. And I'm just going to move it back and forth a bunch of times. I have a feeling that's probably going to make it work at least well enough for us to test the system. There we are, 5.14 volts coming through the EEPROM socket now. Turn this off and on. Yes. Okay, so I know the power rails are good. I'm going to just deoxid these sockets. I'll do a full clean of this board later. Okay, I've reinserted everything except for the SID chip plugged in the connector to the retro tank and the power supply. And Dave, here we go, moment of truth for your 64. Look at that, it worked, it just came right up. <laughs> Another Survivor 64, gotta say thumbs up to that. So there we go, the simplest and easiest fix there is for a 64 dodgy power switch. Deox at D5 is what I used and a whole bunch of on and off cycles and that fixed this thing. Dave, I really have to thank you for sending all this stuff from the UK for me. I really appreciate it, and I can't wait to try out some of these UK games here on your old 64. So the next mail call package. Interesting. Check out this writing here. This looks like Greek. This package is from Leo in Greece. Hi to all my Greek viewers. He emailed me, we chatted about this, and it sounds like something that's very cool. So let me cut this open. A look, there's an address on here I haven't covered up. I don't like to show people's addresses. All right, this should do it. Okay, so some stuff in here and a piece of paper. All right, so what Leo sent me is a modern day MIDI wavetable synthesizer car. This is for the PC, it's an ISA bus. Struggling here with the tape, so we'll use the knife. There we go. The card is a PC MIDI V010, PC MIDI card, and it has the wavetable connector. That's the coolest part about it. Let's open up these other little bags here. This is a MIDI cable, so this plugs into the sound card. I assume one of these connectors is MIDI. I don't see which one. MIDI out is on the bottom. Top one is sound probably for the wavetable. So we connect this. 
and there's the MIDI port. And in this little bag here will be the wavetable connector, the Dream Blaster X2. Leo told me that he worked on this project with a friend of his, I guess in Belgium. Sorry, Leo, if I'm getting it wrong, but they came up with this sound card wavetable MIDI card together. And I am really looking forward to testing this out. Really well made PCB, very cool design. And this will connect up to the wavetable connector. Sound Blaster 16 started having wavetable connectors, or maybe it was the A32s. I'm not super familiar with this type of thing. I had Sound Blaster cards and I even had a Gravis ultrasound at one point, but I was just never hugely into the MIDI sound landscape on the PC. All right, so this card needs an IRQ. It uses an IO address. <laughs> nice, he has a jumper set up for volume. We have loud, medium, and quiet. Cute clip art about not aligning the daughter bar correctly. I guess it can cause irreparable damage to your equipment. I will definitely have to read more about how this card works, but it looks like the DB9 connector that's right here on the card allows you to break out two MIDI in, a second MIDI out, and a third MIDI out. And this uh, TRS jack here, this is the first MIDI out there. Very cool. I have a Roland Sound Canvas, an external one that my friend Dave, just Dave, gave me. So I can uh, test that with this, the MIDI output, with some of the old games. It's not as good as an MT32 for the old Sierra games, but hopefully with this wavetable adapter, I can also get some pretty cool sound out of some of those old retro games. I was just watching Phil's excellent video on the Dream Blaster X2 uh, at Phil's Computer Lab. If you haven't seen his channel, definitely check it out. He goes over into great detail how this little daughter board works. And what's really interesting, I didn't realize, is you can connect it via USB to a modern Windows 10 computer and use the headphone jack that right here on by his finger that will then output sound. And this will act as a general MIDI synthesizer to a modern computer. That is kick ass. I'll put a link in the description below for more information on this card. And if you want to get one yourself, you can order them there. But I will also have a future video where I look at this card more in depth and really explore what it's capable of. Thank you, Leo, for sending this over to me. Really appreciate it. All right, next up, we have something from Sean in LA. Pretty cool little envelope, Sean. Look at this uh, Millennium Falcon there, but looks like it's also a hand. All right, very cool. So Sean reached out to me via email as well, so I, I knew this was coming. I got some bare PCBs, but you may recognize this one here from Retro Recipes. This is the Vic Squared, and it allows you to take a Commodore 64 and use two separate Vic 2 chips, one PAL and one NTSC, and actually switch between them. So one machine can be configured for PAL and NTSC simultaneously with easy switching. This has the PAL VIC-2 chip in it, as well as the PAL crystal oscillator you need to run the computer at. You can't just switch the VIC-2 chip alone. So this machine has been modded that way, but uh, it would be very cool to have one where I can do both. I'm thinking of some modifications to this board that might do away with the relays and, and simplify things a little bit and make it a little more elegant. I might be purely having a pipe dream and my modifications won't work. Anyways, you can definitely get this board right now, and I'll put a link in the description to it so you can get your own if you'd like to have one of these switchable Commodore 64s for yourself. Sean sent over some extra boards, which I forgot at the moment what they are. He told me an email, but... Uh, oh, right, I remember now. This is the composite video adapter for the Mattel Aquarius. And I do have one of these machines, and... One of the things that's really annoying on it is that it's only got an RF output. So this is a pretty cool little mod that I will have to do on that machine. I haven't even showed it on the channel. So definitely this will be something I'll need to break out and do in a future video. So this board says it's the C64 KRV switcher. I don't quite remember exactly what that does. So I'm gonna have to go look it up. So here's the GitHub repository for the C64 KRV switcher. Essentially what this board does is it takes an Arduino Nano and it reads the keyboard on the C64 and allows you to switch between several different kernel images. It also has facility for switching the inputs to the VIC-2 squared board that will switch between PAL and NTSC. Sean took inspiration from two other projects to make this one. One was Sven Peterson's keyboard switcher project, and he also used some of my crappy Arduino source code from my switcher project code to help make this possible. 
What's really awesome about this is it's an evolution of my project. I only use the restore key and you had to hold it down for a certain number of seconds. He's actually looking at the restore key and keys one through eight to quickly switch to a specific kernel. And then he's using restore plus nine to switch between PAL or NTSC. And of course the microcontroller will restart the Commodore 64 as necessary. It is a very slick implementation and here's a picture of the completed project. On the GitHub repository, Sean has the Adreno code and the bomb, and I also see schematics, but I don't see any Gerber files. So I'll put a link in the description to where you can get this board or download the Gerber files. So thank you very much, Sean, for sending this stuff over. If you want to buy any of these parts, I'll have links in the description below, so you check that out. But of course, I'm going to have future videos where I look at these things separately, so those more in-depth videos might pique your interest a little bit more. And we have our last package here. This one is from Daniel in the Netherlands. So hi to all my Dutch viewers. Daniel and I have chatted a bunch of times on email over the last couple of years. He's helped me with my Commodore 128 problems and other things like that. And he hit me up and he told me about a new project he's working on that he was looking for help on testing. So he sent me a nice long letter, but I will get to this in a second. Let's talk about what he has sent right here. So in this bag was a little piece of anti-static foam with four chips and a little PCB. And what he is working on is a PLA replacement for the Commodore 64 that uses the very easily attainable and common GAL 20V8B chips. These are available in both 15 nanoseconds, which are these two chips, and 20 nanoseconds or 25 nanoseconds, which are these two chips. And this PCB here takes pin headers to plug into the PLA socket. And then you install two pin sockets for the ICs that go on the top side. And that forms a PLA replacement. I have a Moss PLA sitting right here. These ICs are notorious for failing. Basically, Commodore used a process that is not reliable. And these chips are pretty much the most common failure in Commodore 64s. And when they die, the machine doesn't work at all. So getting replacements of these is becoming harder and harder. There are other replacements available like CPLD ones, but they definitely cost more and they use surface mount chips. These chips are available for China very, very cheaply. You can probably get 10 of them for about $3, $4. And then a cheap PCB like this, you could make a whole assortment of these from PCBWay or a company like that for $5. And then with a few little extra parts, you program these and you have a working PLA potentially. I'm very excited about this, so I will have a video coming up very soon about how it's going with the testing and any incompatibilities that I find with this product. He also sent along this, which was pretty cool. This is a kernel adapter for the 64. Now, there are lots of these out there. You can find PCBs uh, to download and make that you could just use standard EEPROMs, but I think he wanted to make something that would work with chips that were still in production. So this little surface mount chip here is a 28C256. These are flashable with a little adapter on any kind of mini pro. But then this plugs into the Commodore 64. You have to add some pin headers, and then you can have multiple kernels and stuff, kind of similar to what I've done with my Arduino board. And one thing that's important to note is that there are a whole slew of computers that this adapter will work for. So VIC-20, 64, 128, the 1541 disk drive, the Atari 800XL, and the Atari 1050 disk drive as well, and the Sinclair ZX80 and 81 computers as well. I will put links to Daniel's uh, kernel adapter in the description below. The PLA stuff is not ready yet, so when I produce the bigger video, there'll be information and links on this thing, so you can find out more information and look where to get it. All right, we have another package. This one is from Robert in Connecticut. Robert is the gentleman who designed that most excellent Tandy 1000 EX and HX memory card slash serial card slash compact flash card. I featured that video a little while back. If you haven't seen it, check the description. I'll put a link to it. I don't think there's gonna be anything different about this one over the one that you guys have already seen, at least functionality wise. He really sent this as a thank you for helping him test out this board on my two Tandy 1000s. Very nice packaging, Robert. Wow. Oh, wow. This board, it looks amazing. So Robert ordered a very special limited run of these boards. It was a black PCB substrate and a clear solder mask. 
So all of the copper underneath is showing through in a beautiful copper color. This is the production board as well, which he slightly changed from the last one. He's very smartly still using the Chinese compact flash adapter, which originally was for an ISA card slot. But instead of bending the ISA slot bracket like he had the last time, he actually ended up making a PCB that was cut out to the exact shape. This color scheme though is just absolutely fantastic. I, I am totally speechless on how awesome this looks. Here's how Robert's early prototype board looks, and that's the bent slot cover I was talking about. And this is how the new one looks in here. This is absolutely sexy. Keep in mind that Robert ordered a very limited run of the copper board. So if you order one from him, it's gonna look more like this, green or yellow or one of the standard colors. So if you have an unexpanded Tandy 1000 EX or HX and you really wanna pimp it out, check the description below. I'll put a link to Robert's board so you can order one for yourself. Well, that's gonna be it for my second mail call on Adrian's Digital Basement. If you have anything you wanna to donate to the channel, you can hit the channel about page to email me if you'd like to talk to me about it first. And there's also an address and it'll be in the description below and also on my channel about page. So you can send stuff at will to the PO box if you'd like. All of these things will be featured in upcoming videos, although I can't guarantee when those are gonna come out only because I have a ton of projects piled up for the channel and not to mention I have a regular day job and a life. So <laughs> that's a work-life balance thing, right? So anyways, if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do, you can hit thumbs up. If you didn't, you can hit thumbs down. You can subscribe for more videos, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And thank you again for watching. Goodbye.